Good evening and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And as you know, it's a series of shows that are leading up to November's election that should get you into a position where you really understand your vote better and the, what you're voting for, not what you're voting against. So we have all the candidates for the state senate. We all have all the candidates for the state house. Bill Fraser is on one of these shows talking about the parking garage bond. Bill Fraser's on another show talking about the water bond. And basically, these are good shows. Tonight, we have a state senate candidate, and I'm happy to have Anthony Polina sitting next to me. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Anthony, what part of Washington County are you from? I live in Middlesex, not too far outside Montpelier, about seven miles outside of Montpelier in a fairly nice neighborhood near the Rumney Elementary School. Our kids went to school. So it's a, it's a really nice place to be. It does mean that we get directed into Montpelier for most of our you know, shopping and commercial activity, but I love Middlesex. It's a great town. People get along well and seem to really care about the place. What did, what's the number one problem amongst your neighbors in, in Middlesex? What do they look towards the state house for? Well, I don't know if there's... And is a, it any different than people in Northfield, Montpelier, or Barrie, or, or East Montpelier, or other parts of Washington County? I don't think so. I think that there's two things that come to mind. One is um, people are always struggling with the cost of health care. And that can, particularly as you and your neighbors get older and you end up, you know, using the health care system more than you used to, there's more... Well, that's a polite way to talk to a guy <laughs> in his 60s. Well, uh, join the club. <laughs> But, uh, you know, you run into a lot of conversations about people, well, I'm, I'm going to keep working longer because I need to keep the health care, that kind of thing. So there's an ongoing concern about health care. And then I think the other thing that is of concern to a lot of people in different ways, not, all, not always come from the same place, but has to do with the funding of education and the future of our schools. And a town like Middlesex, for example, which is not a real small town. I mean, it's small, but it's not tiny. The school has really been the center of the town's activities. It's where the kids go to learn how to read and write and do their math, but it's also where they learn to be a part of the community and learn to get along with each other. And there's a lot of events at the school that bring the, f the community together. And I think there's always been a fear that we might lose that connection if we in some way, in any way lost the school, which I'm not saying we're going to. Well, so there's that 46, how did the Consolidation Act play out well, in Middlesex? Oh, not very well. It didn't get a big approval in Middlesex. First of all, I, I voted against Act 46 because I was afraid that it was going to force schools to close or force uh, districts to do things they didn't want to do. Which it ended up doing. Exactly. I was right in that case. Um, Middlesex, Worcester, Callis, East Montpelier, Berlin, the U32 district, what we call the U32 district, has actually decided not to do any kind of merger at all. And Are has they in court on that? Well, I don't know if they're in court yet, but they're going to end up in court. They're one of the districts that has been digging in their heels the most and fighting back the most against any kind of forced consolidation. It has to do partly with the fact that some towns have a lot of debt and other towns don't have any debt, so you have to pick up the debt of the, those other towns. But I think that there's more to it than that. I think it's really a feeling that they don't want to lose control of the sc local schools and don't want to see them. The, control of the schools sort of get vested in a larger organization. So I think part of it is um, not wanting to be forced to take on debt, but I think it's bigger than that. I think it's broader than that, and it just has to do with wanting to maintain local control over the school. But was the amount, or it was, were the amount of school districts in Vermont really sustainable over the long run, having so many micro school districts? You know, I don't think we know that for a fact, whether, whether well, we it's... we never will. Right, we, now we never will. I, well, I, and I'm not against mergers or even, in a sense, I hate to say it, but I'm not against closing schools if that's what a community chooses to do. I think the problem we're having right now is that people are being forced to do things that they weren't sure they wanted to do, and the timeline's pretty quick, and there's a carrot being held out. If you do if you merge, you get certain tax breaks and whatnot. So I think it's more the way it's gone about. I think that... We had this decrease in student enrollment, of course, that we're all well aware of. But well, that's not hand, a short-term thing. That, that's a say, long skid. Right, but it's going to go, go down lower, and then it's going to come back up. And when you think about the future of our communities, and you think about we're trying to um, encourage young families to stay in Vermont, start businesses in Vermont. And come into Vermont. And come into Vermont. And you're not going to want to come into a town that doesn't have a local school necessarily. At least it's not going to be a point that you're going to cherish. You're going to wish that your community you looked at to buy a house. If you're moving up from Connecticut or something, you're going to wonder about the local school and how far is it, how long is your kid going to be on the bus, that kind of a thing. So I think that we could have done more to 
engage the public in a real discussion about what directions to take our public schools before we pass Act 46. And that was one of the arguments I made when I voted against it. I said, we haven't engaged the public very much in this conversation yet. It's all been rhetoric about declining enrollment, increased costs, but we don't really know what Vermonters want to do about this. So we had proposed that we have like a year-long public engagement process first to make sure that we got out and heard what Vermonters had to say. Unfortunately, there were people who felt the need to get something done. And Act 46 was the result of that need to get something done. And I, I mean, again, it's working for some people in some parts of the state, but it's causing a lot of aggravation for people in other parts of the state. I just think people are being forced to do something that they weren't necessarily planning to do. And I think that's But when you have a good. common pool, yeah. doesn't it make it more difficult for those small outliers to make that decision? It does make it harder, but I think it doesn't, I don't think we should give up on trying to help them be able to make those decisions. And I think when you talk about sm spread out school districts, it's not so much around here in Central Vermont where, you know, Montpelier and U32, you practically throw a stone and hit one school or the other. But yeah, if but think East Montpelier, it, Middlesex, that's a jump. That's a little jump, yeah. But it's not as bad as in the Northeast Kingdom areas where kids might have to be on the bus for an hour to get to where they're, get to where they're going if they're in a merged district. So. I think there's a lot of um, impacts that we're not fully aware of yet that we're going to be learning as time goes on, and I, I just wish we had taken a different approach. Is there a dynamic to this function that you see this being tweaked in the future? You, you well, say that it will become apparent as we go on. Sure. So do you see this as a dynamic bill that, that well, once yes. the incentives are stripped, will we'll change? Well, the problem, my hesitation is that I hope so. But the Board of Education is kind of digging in its heels and getting ready to probably make people for, do forced mergers. And the other thing is that once a school is closed or a merger takes place, it's going to be it's hard gone. to unmerge it or reopen it. So that's the problem is that that's why we should have thought about it longer before we did it because it, tweaking it later might not solve a real dilemma because it's, you, know, you can't replace something that you've shut down necessarily. It's better to keep it open until you're really sure you want to shut it down or not. What about the unified teachers contract, uh, health contract? That was a discussion that went on and on last year. What was your feeling on that? Well, most of the folks that we talked about, well, I shouldn't say it started that way. My feeling was that we should allow things to be negotiated on the local level because that's where people really know what the issues are and you know, know what they're dealing with their neighbors and their, their employees in a sense, meaning the public school teachers. I think there's going to be more of a movement in that direction again, to tell you the truth. I think some of the teacher groups and others are beginning to think that they might be able to live with such a plan if it's done right, if, if it's going to actually reduce some costs too. And again, I, I'm not an expert on that to say whether it would or would not, but I would really want to see the evidence that it's going to be good for but us. But you're open to that? I'm more open to it now than I was before. The more I've thought about it, the more I've talked about it with folks, it seems that there's an increasing openness to at least exploring it more. You don't want necessarily to go to a statewide teacher's contract necessarily because then you've got, you know, the state determining the direction of your local school and, and paying benefits and whatnot. And then the problem is if there's dissatisfaction with the contract, statewide contract. A you statewide get teacher strike. Yeah, a statewide teacher strike, which would not be such a great thing to have happen. And the thing is, the right to strike is, is a fundamental right that teachers have and that other folks that organized labor have. And we have to be really careful. In fact, we should, we should refuse to take that right away. We haven't had a lot of teacher strikes. We've had a couple. Of, you know, we, they're a big deal all the time, so we focus on them. But it's not as if there's a strike going on all the time. There's actually the teachers have been pretty good at not, not going out on strike. And I think that given the fact that school budgets are set on the local level, the decisions are made there about the costs and the benefits there's usually a lot of uh, unanimity between the local folks and the teachers for the most part that allows us to go forward in a way that works for everybody. So strikes are rare, but they're an important part of American democracy and we should not never take that right away. Could you see moving towards Maine's model of 14 supervisory districts, one per county? I think so. I mean, I, I, I had to say a little bit because I'm not super familiar with it, but I know what you mean. And I do think that we have too many supervisory districts. I think that's just a no-brainer in a sense. I mean, we've got a, yeah, I forget the number offhand, but we have a, a lot, lot a lot of supervisory districts that seem to do duplicative work. And I think that one way we could save some money would be to reduce the number of supervisory superintendents and supervisory districts and allow decisions to be made at the school level. And 
consolidate that way as opposed to consolidating schools to consolidate some of that overhead administration. Now, I know you've been involved in the discussion on the macro level. We're talking about micro level of education now. On the macro level, how do you pay for this? Is it the property tax? Is it the income tax? What's your well, feeling? Oh, I know the answer, but <laughs> if you could give the answer. Right now, it's, it's, believe it or not, most people don't realize this, but right now it's both. But the short answer is if we want, we should have a funding formula for education that is um, more um, fair and more simple and generates revenue in a way that makes sense. Right now, because we have income sensitivity, two-thirds of Vermont... Now, what is income sensitivity for those who don't know? It means that for some, well, for actually, for this, this relates to two-thirds of Vermont, so it's a lot. If you have an income that's below $90,000 a year, you can pay for your school, you, you pay your school tax based either on your property value or a certain percentage of your income, whichever is lower. For people making between 90 and 137.50, which gets a little complicated, there's a combination where they pay partly based on their income and partly based on some of their property value, but that's not worth going into, meaning because it's very boring for the average listener or, or viewer. But say it this way, that two-thirds of Vermonters pay through the income sensitivity program, which means they pay based on their property or their income, whichever is lower, a percentage of their income, which usually turns out to be, last couple of years, it's been in round numbers, it's been a little below 3% of their income, it's like 2.9, 2.7, it varies. But the problem is that low and moderate income people pay based on their income, and they're paying about, let's say, 3% of their income. But if you're a wealthier person who doesn't um, qualify for income sensitivity, if you're making $200,000. Now, are we talking about 000. the wealthy person making $200,000? whose first home is in, in Vermont? Or yes, we're talking, about, home home, no, we're talking Vermont. about homestead okay. owners, house and two acres that they live in, primary residence. If you're making 90,000, well, if you're making, let's say, well, let's say $90,000 a year, a year, you're paying about 3% of your income. But if you're making $900,000 a year, you're paying about a half a percent of your income. Why? because that's the way the income sensitivity program works. It, if, you're, if you're a higher income person, you pay just on your property, and your property value is a smaller percentage of your income. So I think it's not fair that somebody making $50,000 a year pays almost 3% of their income to fund schools, but somebody making $500,000 a year pays only 1% of their income to fund schools. If we think it's fair for a moderate income person to pay 3% of their income, why isn't it fair for a wealthy person to pay 3% of their income? So I think the way we do it now is not fair. So we need to move away from this convoluted property tax-based system and move towards one that's based more on income and have everybody pay their fair share. If we did that, uh, again, I don't want to bore you, but... No, no, <laughs> just, you're not boring me, you're boring the people who <laughs> are watching. The way, to talk, the way to think about it is that there's two ways to think about to illustrate it. One is that if you make in ninety thousand dollars or less, you pay based on your income, and your property, whichever is lower. If you're making above that, you pay based on your property, your income, whichever is higher. So if you're a millionaire living in a half a million dollar house, you're going to pay a certain percentage of your income of, based on the million dollars because that's your income and it's more higher than your property value. If the next year your income dropped down to a hundred thousand, but you're still living in a half a million dollar house, you'd pay based on the property right. value of half a million dollars. Now, if we did that and put a cap on how much the wealthier person would pay, which is a benefit to them, we would actually raise about an additional 35 to $40 million in revenue that we could put towards schools or put towards some other use. What so, happens to the person whose secondary home is in Vermont? Are they kicking in at all? Yeah, they're paying the non-residential property tax, which is the same everywhere around the state. So they would continue to do that. This would just affect the house in two acres. So, if, you're, if you have 25 acres, you, what I just described would relate to your house and two acres, and then you'd still pay your non-residential property tax on the rest of your land. So it does get kind of convoluted, and I, I don't want to say it's boring, but it's important. Well, how, for, do you, how do you change that? How do you gain a consensus, and why has there never been a consensus on changing it? Well, to tell you the truth, well, I think there's, there's, there's why hasn't there been a consensus is in part because people are resistant to change, is one reason. It's just hard, and this is a major change. But when the change. scale has 90% of us up here right. and 10% of us down here, well, wouldn't it seem obvious 
that the 90% would ultimately ask the same questions that you're asking? And they're beginning to do that. I think there's growing, there's a growing interest in moving away from the system as we have it now, moving towards who something is that that who, are the, who are the advocates for that besides you? Well, actually, there's a number of legislators, but there's also people involved in education more than anything else who are more aware of what we're talking about. There's a lot of um, nonprofits also recently who are supportive of, edu of e equity and education who are beginning to say, how can we get away from this constant arguing about how we fund schools and the property tax burden, as we call it. You know, we talk about the cost of health care, the price of food, but we're talking about property taxes. Taxes, it's a burden. You know, to tell you the truth, health care is more of a, paying for health care is more of a burden than taxes are, to tell you the truth. But we always refer to it as a burden. That's a tangent, but it irritates me. When you speak of, of paying for health care, would you favor skinny plans in Vermont as a number of states are moving towards uh, health, Held the old health care plans that had very low monthly payments, high deductibles, they don't cover mental health, right, right. they don't cover maternity care, they don't cover a number of items that Vermont requires covered, and now they're coming to be legal. Would you allow that to make no, I think that's a step health in the care more affordable for people? It, no, it's a step in the wrong direction, You know, because it's not more affordable if it's not covering what you, things that you need mental health, things of that sort, ongoing chronic conditions, those are all things that need to be covered. And if we, we're fooling ourselves if we think that's giving everybody a cheap health care policy that has minor coverage or leaves out coverage for a lot of different conditions and needs is going to somehow save money. It's really not. It's going to push the money. We, how can we make health care more affordable in Vermont? Well, You've one, been working on that issue for I years. know. We're, we're making progress. I don't know. We're making some progress, but it's a slow. It's a federal it's, issue it's, that you're right. working well, that on is state part level. Of it. It's a slog that we're moving. It's like mired in mud and difficulty. But Well, you made progress on it during the last legislative session in terms of um, importing drugs from Canada if we right. get the federal permission. For right, that. That, and that's part of the problem with some of the changes you want to make around health care and prescription, prescription drug prices. You need federal um, permission to do it, and right now I don't think we're going to be very likely to get that federal permission, but we did pass a bill that would allow the state to essentially become a drug wholesaler and import drugs from Canada and to then sell them across the state through distributors. We also had a large, a long debate about whether or not we could move towards um, universal primary care. What is that? It means the things that you, primary care covers a lot of things from prevention down towards wellness and the kind of things you would normally just go to your primary physician for. That there could be a taxpayer funded, a tax funded system which would put into a pool, put a pool of money in allow all of us to go to our primary care doctors. I don't want to say for free, obviously you'd be paying for it through your right. tax dollars. But all that stuff would be covered, and that would take care of a lot of the basic health care needs that we have. Is we that now in the um, traditional Vermont study stage? I was just going to say. task force <laughs> stage. How many task force do we have? We got, we got many of them. And it's funny because every year we sit in the state house. We don't sit in the state. Every committee is given a list of studies that are coming forward. <laughs> And you check off which ones you don't think you ever want to see again, you know, that we've seen enough of this and enough of that. Enough. Have of this. we seen enough studies of the lake? Of the lake? Yes. <laughs> no, we're going to see more of those, actually, because the reason why we're seeing those, as you can imagine, is that because an excuse for not doing anything about it, right? We're just going to keep studying it. What was that bill that passed last time without funding on dealing with cleaning the lake? Well, it wasn't much in the end, to tell you the truth. It, start, it went through various stages, and there were times during the session when it actually included like funding mechanisms to help clean up the water and whatnot. And by the when time, does the treasurer become involved in that? Well, what she does is she, she's been involved, and she put out a, a report. See, there's that word again, but it's different. <laughs> but she put out a report that... Um, a report is different than a study. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, you hope it has action steps in it anyway. Uh, but anyway, she basically went through a series of potential funding sources and analyzed them and said, this would raise this amount of money, this would raise this amount of money, this would be a burden or not a burden, meaning to administer. And she basically put it forward sort of a menu, which has been helpful in trying to f wade through the different options. But the problem is none of them, none of the options really fully fund the amount of money we need to come up with over the course of What's a given year. Was it $60 million? Well, it's $25 million on top of everything that we're already doing a year is what we're going to have to do. And, you know, we've talked about a couple of options primarily. One is to bond, which is borrowing money, which is right. not ideal because you're just putting the cost off to, to your children. The other is a per parcel fee, so everybody would pay a, basically like a property tax, which, you know, who wants to do that? 
Um, and also, you'd want to make sure that certain surfaces, impervious surfaces like parking lots, paid a higher fee than you did on your front lawn at home. Right. And then the third option that's been looked at a lot is an uh, occupancy fee, a fee on uh, hotel rooms that would be paid largely by out of staters when they visit Vermont. None of those are ideal. None of them raise enough money to really reach the level that we need to reach in terms of the $25 million a year. But those are probably the three things that are going to be debated the most and looked at the most. They've already been looked at a lot, but everybody gets nervous about implementing any of them. But the problem is, the longer we put it off, I mean, nobody wants to be the bad guy who says, here's how we're going to raise the money. On the other hand, if you don't raise a dollar today, you're going to raise a dollar fifty tomorrow and two dollars a day after that because the problem's not going to go away on its own. So the bill that passed basically set up a committee to think more, think more about it. A study group. Yeah, basically, task force. basically, yes. I forget whether it's a study or a task force, one or the other. And all it did, other than that, was it put into place the mechanisms to um, help Lake Carmi up in the northwestern mm -hmm. part of the state, which is in really, really bad shape. But the thing is about the water quality; it's not just bad environmentally, but as you could imagine, if you, if you pick your, particularly you see this up around St. Albans, St. Albans Bay, where it's really been a bad problem, the, the property values are going down. Nobody, you know, there's homes for sale on the lake, you know, a home on the lake. I mean, who wouldn't want a home on the lake? Well, if you've got a home on the lake, but your dog is going to die if they go in and, like, lap up some water, you don't really want to live there on the lake. So it's really been a pro it's an economic problem as well as an environmental problem. And there's been studies that have been done that have made it clear that the health of the lake is directly um, affects the health of the economy in the lake shed, around Lake Champlain. So there's a tourism and whatnot. So it's a really important issue that needs and to And no one's with. assuming federal funding for that. Well, I guess we get some federal funding, but not, we're not planning on getting much more, let's put it that way. So we have to eventually bite the bullet and come up with a funding source of our own. And it's not going to be fun and it's not going to be easy, but it's going to have to happen. Um, family leave. Uh, paid family leave is that another study? Uh, no, actually, force? we. Or did that's just one, get vetoed. That's one of the things that got vetoed um, at least once, maybe twice. I forget. But you know, but and the interesting thing about that, as you would, my listeners would probably know, that allows you to take time off to care for a family member who might be ill or going through some kind of crisis. The interesting paid, paid time off. It's pay. Yeah, there's, you get a certain percentage of your pay for a certain amount of time. But the interesting thing about that, the, the veto of that by Governor Scott was that that was funded by the workers themselves. It was not a tax on employers or on anybody else. It was to be funded only by workers. So well, is that a mandatory participation by workers? If you and I worked uh, yeah, pretty alongside, sure it's would I have to do that as well? Would, I'm to, pretty sure you would have to. Okay. Yeah, everybody has to chip in to do okay. it. But it, uh, it's a start towards treating making Vermont more family friendly in the workplace as well. You know, we talked before about young families wanting to come to Vermont and stay in Vermont. You know, we want to encourage entrepreneurs and whatnot and, what, and make pe more people want to stay here and raise their families here. One of the ways in which we do that is by having family friendly policies, having good public schools, having paid family leave, having a, a good minimum wage. Those are the kinds of things that a young couple is going to look for when they decide where they're going to live. They're not really worried about the tax base particularly. They're basically worried about the things that are going to affect them most directly, which is quality of life things and quality of the workplace. When we have as many family-owned businesses as we have in Vermont, small family-owned sure. businesses, what is the balancing act between the $15 minimum wage and the small family-owned business? Yeah, no, it's a, I would admit it's not an easy one to, to, to weigh, but we have to keep in mind that Two things I would say: the, the minimum wage bill that passed and was vetoed would have um, implemented the higher minimum wage over a period of time, uh, six or seven years. No, I, I assume that you you were advocating for that. I was realizing that there's a challenge involved, but this the slow this, the timing of it, allowing it to be implemented over time, would cushion the blow and allow businesses to adjust as need be. And also, um, when you think about it, a $15 minimum wage in 2024. The economy it, might ca even catch up to it. Right, at right. Point. There's no telling what, what a livable wage would be by then. The right. other thing, though, from a business point of view, and this, well, this is something I do believe in. People will argue the other side of it, but I think that the best thing we can do for small businesses in Vermont is not give them tax cuts or tax credits or other kinds of development breaks 
what, what businesses really need in Vermont, what small business needs and Main Street business needs is customers who come into their store and have money to spend. And by living, by raising wages, we're going to put more money into the local economy so that people can actually go out and buy pizza, go to the movies, you know, go to various stores, buy what they need, take care of their families, pay their bills. So it generates money in the local economy. Most of the money, people who are not making minimum wage now and would make a higher minimum wage after if we implemented the minimum wage bill are mostly local people who are going to spend that money locally. They're not going to use it to go to the Caribbean. They're not going to use it to buy a yacht. They're going to use it to buy a pair of blue jeans or a pair of boots or take their family out to dinner. So I think that money would be spent locally as well. And keep in mind that when we're talking about minimum wage increases or, or who gets the minimum wage, it's not just you know high school kids and home for summer vacation. It's a lot of adults who are raising families who are trying to get by a minimum wage. So it's, it's a tough one. But I think we're going to revisit that debate. Um, my, there's been a need, not a need, but a um, a call for more analysis, I don't want to say study or task force, um, <laughs> as to what impacts it might have on tip, tip workers in restaurants and whatnot. So I think there'll be some revisiting of some of those issues as well. Uh, speaking, staying on small businesses, uh, the internet being taxed now for right. purchases coming out of the states, where would you take that money and, and use it? I think it's 30 million, is it? Yeah, I don't know. If, I mean, it's hard to say. You, on one hand, when you have something like that, you want to say, well, it should be invested in the development of local businesses, you know, because that's, that's, they, they're the ones who suffer when they lose business to online businesses. So you'd want to pump it back into the economy in a way that supports economic development. But what form that takes, I'm honestly not sure. That money would probably just end up going into the general fund. And I don't know if we want to do that or whether we want to earmark it for something uh, particular. You, uh, the um, state auditor, auditor right. offer. Uh, issued a report on economic development, on the Department of Commerce and yeah. economic development. Do you believe that there that our economic development plans are really effective? No, I'm not. I don't believe that's the key. well. I, I don't believe that they. I, I I'm sure that they don't appear to be effective. You know, some of them may be here and there, but generally, the problem is that we've had. This, and I'm glad that uh, Auditor Hoffer did this report. He and I have talked about this for years before either of us was elected to office. Quite honestly. And the fact is that you give these uh, development incentives, tax credits, whatnot, to businesses sort of in the promise that they're going to create jobs. But then there's very little follow-up to see if they did that or not. And also, business comes in and says, you know, I need a million dollars. And if you give me a million dollars, I'll, I'll, I'll um, enlarge my business and hire 10 people. The question is, would you do it without getting a million dollars? So it's well, this is a discussion that's going on all across every state. And right, because every businesses community. play states against each other too. They say, Absolutely. you give me, give me a million dollars, well, New York's going to give me $10 million. Well, Ohio's going to give me $15 million. Well, Vermont can only afford to give you $1 million. That's all we got, you know, that kind of thing. So they, the businesses play states off against each other. And basically, what that means is that we're giving a million dollars to a business that's coming out of the pockets of other Vermonters who are, you know, not don't have those tax dollars to use for something else because they're not being generated. And you want to make sure that that money is really being used. Number one, that it was necessary that the business would not have created the jobs but for getting the money from the state. And number two, they have to they have to prove up front that they actually created the jobs in order to be, before they can collect the credits or the. Do you believe money. there's enough legislative oversight? Over the agencies, not no. N well, no. I mean, I want legislator uh, right. oversight. I should say. Well, or Vermonter oversight. See, that's you know, sometimes people say, "Oh, the legislature's in session too long. We should be only one month or whatever." But the, le luck. the less time the legislature's around, the more time the decisions are being made by the bureaucrats and state government, and nobody's looking over their shoulder. So when you look at the economic development policies, I think they need to be looked at more closely. When you look at the Agriculture department policies, I think they need to be looked at more closely. I think that there's a number of ways or places where we could use more evaluation of what state agencies are doing. Do you feel that the legislature has enough staff? Well, no, we don't have hardly any staff. I mean, we, what we have is a group of lawyers who work for us, and they're spread very, they're, they're great for what I really want to make that clear that they're really good at what they do. But they work for both sides of an issue. It puts them in a funny like. So I, I might go to somebody, to one of the legislative lawyers, and say, "Please draft me a bill that increases minimum wages." And then somebody else might go to the same guy or same woman and say, "Please draft me a bill that lowers minimum wages." You know, and they have to work both sides. 
which means they have to be fair to both sides, but it also means that their, their, their time is really crunched all the time. So that's all. This, you know, people call me sometimes and say, I'd like to meet with you and your staff to talk about an issue in your office. I'm like, well, first of all, I don't have any staff. Second of all, I don't have an office. Third of all, I can meet you at the coffee shop, but that's about it. So I think that, and the thing is, people will say the legislature costs a lot of money, but if we had a better legislature, we could probably be saving money by having better oversight of state government. What is the legislative budget office in their role then? The Joint Fiscal Office. Is or the Joint Fiscal yeah. Office, I'm sorry. Well, they do the same kind of thing, but there's the Legislative Council, which basically drafts bills and helps with certain analysis of bills, but more the, the workings of the bill. The Joint Fiscal Office then comes in and talks about the cost or the benefit of the economic benefit or cost of the particular bill. So if you're looking at changing from property towards income to fund schools, I work with one of the lawyers to develop the plan to do it. And then I work with the Joint Fiscal Office to say, how would this plan work economically? Would it work or not? And they're stretched very thin also. We don't have much of a staff, and they're really good people, but they really are overworked. Now, if you have children in the room, put your hands over their ears. So policy-wise, you're depending on lobbyists to provide <laughs> information on the issues? Or the yeah, state no, agencies no, you're, themselves? You're, Yes, you're right. Basically, you're very, you don't have any personal staff. There's nobody that works for you personally. So a lot of legislators will rely on, whether they like it or not, lobbyists, be they good or bad, or white hats or black hats, whatever you want to call them, to provide information that then legislators use to develop their positions and make decisions. Which Does is, that sound healthy to you? <laughs> doesn't sound too healthy to me. Too. And I also find that I'm pretty clear on where I stand on a lot of issues, and so I don't get lobbied as much as some people do. I think that's part of the benefit of being clear on where you stand on issues, is people, the lobbyists rarely think they're going to convince me other than otherwise if I've made up my decision or I have a position on a bill. But, but it's not healthy, because you, basically the lobbyists are the ones providing the information, and they all have a vested interest in what they're telling you, obviously. You can have the children come back in the room again. <laughs> uh, marijuana legislation. Well, Where were you on that? Well, I supported it. The Senate actually passed the tax and regulate system. I think, like, honestly, I think Two we passed ago. it. No, we passed it about five times in the last year and a half. Right. And then it would go to the House and it would get not watered down, but changed down into just the Now, what, what was that? I think people have an interest in that. What was the Senate's version? The Senate's tax version, and regulate? briefly, would, put, would allow a certain number of stores to open. It would license those stores. It would license a certain amount of growers. It would license a certain amount of distributors. And it would be, generate a set of tax level uh, per ounce or whatever, however they decided to do it. And so basically it would regulate, it would kind of like, it's different, but what you would imagine the Vermont liquor stores are like. There's only a certain number of them. The, the liquor is provided in a certain way. The like prices are kind of set for the most part. Less Was this sale. modeled after another state? Well, not really. I mean, we looked at other states. Um, we looked at the states that, at the time when we first started coming up with the proposal, I think the other states had just started, meaning it's Oregon, Washington, Washington Colorado, Oregon. Yeah, Oregon. they had just started, so there wasn't a lot to learn from them yet. And so the, the, the debate was really between tax and regulate, which I kind of just described briefly, or just making it legal. So right now in Vermont, marijuana for recreational use is it's legal, quasi, it's, but, but you just it's can't buy it or legal. sell it. Right. So how could something be, they'd be saying like, you know, liquor is legal, but you can't buy it. So you're going to buy it off the black market still. So it, it's kind of silly when you think about it to say something's legal, but there's no way to get it or, or to distribute it amongst your friends or to sell it. So I think, and plus there's no way to raise money off of it. Now we've got Canada today, in fact, right. is legalizing recreational Quebec. use of marijuana in yeah, Quebec. And then we and have. you've got Maine and Massachusetts. Right, so next we're being to us. surrounded, and they're going to tax and regulate in Massachusetts. And so they're going to generate revenue that probably have encouraged Vermonters to go to Massachusetts to, can, to purchase their marijuana there and bring it back. And I don't know if there will be rules against that. I don't see how they'd be enforced. So tax and regulate at least gives you the ability to control what's going on make the whole system legal and generate some revenue. Which the revenue then would go into education and... Um, Somewhat law, for, law enforcement. Law enforcement, that's the word I was looking for, enforcement, education. And then maybe there'd be some extra money left over that we could put towards our state colleges or something like that. Uh, is there a question, um, as in the question of solar panel installers and the like, and large solar panel installers coming into the state from other states, wouldn't there a question in terms sure. of... 
homegrown marijuana from um, Vermont versus large marijuana concerns that are dominating other states? Yeah, no, that's it, and that's a good question, and it's a real concern. That's why there's the argument that went out in the House was it should just be a Vermont scale thing. We should just be able to use it for ourselves, that kind of a thing. Which, I mean, I kind of understand that, but that puts you then in a position of you can have something, but you can't buy it or sell it. Plus, it means we're going to lose revenue that other states are going to gain. So I think that um, one of the things we were concerned about was limiting the number of stores and the number of distributors to a set number so that it wouldn't be that um, viable for a large corporation to come in and try to do it. You could actually say that they had to be Vermont residents, what have you. So there are certain safeguards you could put into the system to discourage out-of-state corporations. But those would also in. make it easier to ascertain quality and, and that sort of thing, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, you'd have to definitely maintain quality. We also didn't talk, didn't allow for the use of edibles or things that might encourage, you know, young kids to see something that looks like a lollipop or whatever right, right. And to end up, you know, getting stoned on marijuana. While we're uh, on the question of drugs, um, what about prescription drugs and, and opioids and, and that sort of thing? What's your take on, on the opioid situation in Vermont and how the state is reacting to it? Well, I think it's a serious problem, but I'm, and I think we're reacting fairly well to the problem itself, meaning we have treatment centers and whatnot that are being relatively effective and whatnot. The problem is we're not doing enough in actual prevention of the problem. And How would you do more? What well, is it? I'm, I'm not really sure, quite honestly. I mean, would you crack down on pharmacists and doctors? Or? Well, we've done that, though. That's right. the problem. I'm not that the problem. <laughs> that's the that, solution to some but degree. That, to some degree, but it doesn't really has not solved the problem. Um, we were talking, I was taking testimony just the other day by some folks who work on this stuff all the time, and one of them said very clearly, you know, we have prevention programs, and we have a good one here in Washington County, for example, but we don't have a prevention system the way we should, meaning a statewide systematic way of um, coordinating all our prevention efforts. Do we have a task force on it? We probably have a couple of task force. We do, actually. The governor, has, the governor has a task force studying a number of things about it. But, you know, the other thing that came up in talking with um, some of the legal folks the other day and something that I feel strongly about is that the root problem of the opioid crisis and, or the drug problem, because it's not just opioids, but it is um, the way it's referred to, and now heroin is cheaper than oxycodone and things of that sort, but the real problem has to do with why people move in that direction in the first place. Why do they feel hopeless? Why, do they, why aren't they working? Why well, aren't they? I think it's obvious that these are painkillers. Right. These people are feel, feeling, feeling psychological pain. pain. Right, they're feeling pain, and the pain comes from living in poverty, having no, no um, no way out of a low income, low paid job, having family crisis going on all the time, maybe having mental health problems. But I really do think a lot of it is centered on the fact that our culture has been one where people work harder and harder, but they have a harder time paying their bills. You know, this last year, median family income in Vermont fell again. And today, median family income in Vermont is about where it was in 2007. Clearly, Inflation adjusted. Yeah, no, no, just in real dollars. It's oh, about okay. sixty thousand. So it's worse yeah, when you it's worse. adjusted for inflation. Yeah, you know the cost of health care has gone up. The cost of college. I mean, everything goes up, but income is basically where it was. You know, long seventeen. But that's a national years. issue. It is a national issue, but we have to find ways to address it because that's one reason why people get frustrated enough to feel hopeless enough to decide that, or not to decide, but to f end up, you know, fighting with their lifelong addiction problems. So it's, it's, it's a problem of greed, I think. You know, we have enough money in this state to take care of these problems, whether it's the cost of education or the opioid crisis. You know, I always ask people kind of like, where'd the money go? How is it that our parents and grandparents were able to build the interstate highways and the roads and bridges and the dams and they sent the generation to college and we have trouble fixing the potholes around central Vermont? I mean, where does, is there any less money in Vermont now than there was? 50 or 60 or 70 years ago? No, there's more money than ever before. It's just that the money's being taken off by those at the top and those at the bottom. Most working Vermonters are not seeing their paychecks go up. So we've become a more greedy culture, and I think that's one of the reasons why more people are falling in with drugs and other forms of bad behavior. Uh, I want to walk through one state house issue last year where you must have really been stretched as a Washington County Senator you're all the way up in Middlesex. You go all the way down through Barrie and Northfield. Guns. 
Yeah. There is no consensus in this county on guns, is there? Well, I think if you, it depends on how you look at consensus. If you just take a poll, you know, which is some, one of the ways you measure where people are right. at. Not saying they're which always, we don't do. Right, right. right. But the polls will tell you that the majority of Vermonters support the bills that were passed. But uh, there are still a lot of people who feel strongly otherwise, and it, it does vary right going around the county. We, just the other night, we went down to visit with the gun owners of Vermont, and a bunch of candidates went down, and we actually had a good conversation. A little bit of, of it was about guns, but a lot of it was around the other issues that you and I have just talked about, around wages and income and what we're doing for the rural economy, things of that sort. So they were, their, their, their issue is not just tied narrowly to guns, but I think that what we're seeing is that we took steps to try to make Vermonters safer, which is both a, a practical and a psychological or emotional kind of safety that people were yearning for. And we passed bills that aren't really going to change the way people relate to firearms. I mean, you have to be a little older to buy a gun on your own, but it's not going to, nobody's having well, the We have to go through a background check. Now. Right, which is a pretty... That is a change. It is a change, but it's a pretty painless process from what I understand. And it's the not... The bump stocks, very few people own bump right. stocks. Very few people want to own bump stocks. Right. I imagine the magazines, for those people who are enamored of large magazines, they can still keep them. Right, and they're going to. The only, you know, very few have been confiscated or anything of that sort. So. And nobody's going to be stopped from owning a firearm or maintaining a firearm unless they're a dangerous person, because part of the law we right. passed said they exactly. could be taken away from people who are domestic, abuse. domestic abusers, that kind of thing. So I actually think that, and I, I, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but my feeling is that people, Vermonters are going to find that the laws that we passed are fairly reasonable in the sense that they're not going to affect anybody's ability to own a firearm and use them responsibly. And once that settles in, people will see that it was, it was whether it was the, I, I think it was the right thing to do. Some people may say it was the wrong thing to do, but it's not going to have any negative impacts on Vermont families who want to be responsible. Well, I think owners. if you talk to those people, which you, you were listening to those people, they were in the right. hallways all over sure. the place. I think where their concern might have been is that it took two years for death with dignity to pass. Right. It took two years for civil unions to pass. It took two years and a veto for gay marriage to pass. These these social issues normally work their way slowly through. This yeah. one was a very tight window. And I think you're absolutely right. And I understand that frustration because I think think people felt at the same time when you mentioned like with uh, civil unions and gay marriage, those kind of marriage equality, those things. And I think the irony is we act quickly on, on those kinds of issues, but we didn't do anything to like raise the minimum wage again. Right. We didn't do anything for paid family leave. We didn't do anything to lower the price of prescription drugs. We didn't do anything to lower the well, cost of Well, we did, in, in a sense, by saying that we're going well, to Well, we, we, sent, we set out a path. We haven't right, done it. exactly, yet. but still, that is... But that I can is understand why somebody who's, move. you know, a regular working class person who enjoys their guns and is a responsible gun owner feels like they went and passed these bills to, like, control gun, gun owners right away, but they didn't do anything to, like, make sure my paycheck went up or to make my family any right. better off. So I, can, I understand that frustration. I really do. On that, we're going to leave. We're going to close. Thank you so very much for being here this evening. Thanks for having me. I think this is a good thing you're doing. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I hope that you'll watch all the shows in the series because all of them are well worth watching. And the candidates are great this time through. And the issues that uh, Bill is discussing are important. And, but one more and more important thing, and that's to get out and vote on Election Day and to urge your family and your neighbors to get out and vote because that is really a fundamental for democracy. We're not going to tell you how to vote. You've seen everyone. I'm not going to make any suggestions. But I do suggest that it is your civic duty as well as your civic right to vote. Exercise it. Thank you.